very good afternoon everyone and welcome to uh, the second vertical of today's ZDH 2020 training program. In today's vertical, we have with us Professor Kunal Roy. Professor Kunal Roy is associated with the uh, Department of Pharmaceutical Technology, Jadavpur University. His uh, research interest includes uh, QSAR and molecular modeling, chemoinformatics, drug design, ecotoxicological modeling, and many else. Uh, Professor uh, Roy has been contributing to the DH 2020 training program since the very inset. So today is his third lecture. I really thank you, sir, for uh, your time and contribution to this program. Uh, in today's session, he will be talking about uh, how to determine applicability, domain and reliability of predictions of a QSR model. So I now hand over the session to uh, Professor Kunal Roy. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and good afternoon to all. Today's topic is uh, how to determine applicability domain and reliability of predictions of a QSR model. I've already taken two uh, uh, classes on QSR, one on uh, 15th uh, of July and then on 2nd of August uh, on introduction, various aspects of introduction uh, QSR. Today, we'll talk about applicability domain. So from the, the last two lectures, we already know that QSAR is a ligand based modeling approach, and this is a statistical approach of correlating uh, biological activity as a response with uh, descriptors uh, which represent molecular structure information. And we apply appropriate statistical tool to develop a model and the derived model can be used for prediction of new set of data for the target endpoints. So using a small set of uh, chemical compounds with their biological activity values determined, we can develop a model which can then be used for prediction of a large number of compounds. And for this large number of compounds, we may not have the experimentally derived data known previously, so we can predict uh, their data, uh, maybe biological activity or toxicity or any other property. So it becomes important for us to know whether the developed model can be used for prediction of the new set of data or not, because we cannot use any model for any set of data. There is applicability domain aspect which we should consider. The second important point is the reliability of predictions. When we have any quantitative model, uh, this is a mathematical model, so we can apply it for prediction of the new set of compounds. But we must determine what is the reliability of prediction. We'll get some value as predictions, but what is the reliability? That should be also known this is uh, to some extent related to applicability domain, but not fully. So we should know these aspects, applicability domain and reliability of predictions. I've already discussed that any QSR model should be developed based on OECD guidelines. OECD means Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. They have formulated a set of guidelines which are valid mainly for regulatory QSRs, but can also be used for the problems, drug discovery problems. So according to these principles, we have uh, five points. According to OECD principle one, we should have a defined endpoint and the biological activity values which we are using for developing QSR models should be in the appropriate format, which I have already discussed in my last classes. According to OECD principle two, there should be an unambiguous algorithm. Uh, so everything should be uh, defined so that if anybody else is uh, redeveloping the model, he will exactly get the same model. He can reproduce my model. So the method of descriptor uh, calculation, method of descriptors thinning, method of training and test set division, the method of uh, statistical approach of uh, model development, maybe the regression based or classification, everything should be clearly defined so that it can be reproduced. Then according to OECD principle three, there should be 
a defined domain of applicability, for, which we'll discuss today. Uh, according to OECD principle three, each model has its own applicability domain. And then according to OECD principle four, there should be appropriate uh, uh, validation measures and uh, statistical uh, metrics to define the acceptability of any QSR model. And finally, according to OECD principle five, there should be a mechanistic interpretation of the developed model so that we can have the idea about the physiochemical meaning of the model developed. It is not just a quantitative uh, prediction. There should be a physiochemical meaning which can be used for exploring the mechanistic aspect of the biological activity that we are going to model. But today we are concentrating on OECD principle three, that is applicability domain. Applicability domain can be defined uh, as physiochemical structure and biological space of the training set compounds. So it is basically the knowledge of uh, training set compounds, the training set space, uh, the property space and, uh, uh, and the structural space of chemical uh, uh, compounds in the training set uh, based on which the model learns. So the model learns uh, based on the information obtained from the training set compounds. So if any external compound or test compound is too much dissimilar to the training set compounds, then that particular test compound cannot be handled well by the model developed because our model has not learned how to behave for that kind of chemical features. So the test compound should be within the applicability domain of the developed model. Applicability domain of a QSR should be described in terms of the most relevant parameters. That is usually those that are descriptors of the model. So usually we use uh, the descriptors uh, uh, that, uh, that are present in the model to define activity domain of the model, but sometimes it is also possible to use the response values also to define applicability domain. Ideally, QSR should only be used to make predictions within the domain by interpolation and not by extrapolation. So we'll come to this point. So in other uh, words, we can define AD as a theoretical region in the chemical space surrounding both the model descriptors and model response. While building a QSL model, the applicability domain plays a deciding role for checking the uncertainty of predictions for specific models. Based on how similar it is uh, uh, to the compounds uh, used for development of the model, because QSL is basically based on uh, similarity principle. So the test compound should be similar to some of the training set compounds. And if there is uh, not sufficient number of training compounds similar to particular test compound, then the model may be unreliable for prediction for that particular test compound. Thus, the prediction of a model to response employing a QSR is applicable only if the molecule is within the domain of the model as it is unfeasible to predict the complete universe of chemicals. We cannot have any universally applicable global model which will perform very good for all compounds. We can develop some global model, but usually the precision of predictions will be low than local model. So we should take into account this aspect. Now, Hanser et al. proposed the significance of decision domain in three-step procedure, which includes uh, applicability domain, reliability domain, and decidability domain. So we have to consider applicability domain as the whole concept of a decision domain. Decision domain, the scope within which it is possible to make a decision based on a valid, reliable, and non-equivocal prediction. So it has three parts, applicability uh, based on the chemical space and property space of the training compounds, the reliability of prediction, there should be some measure to know the reliability of prediction. So we may have several compounds within the applicable domain, but for all compounds, the reliability is not same. So even the compounds are within the applicable domain, there should be some measures of reliability of predictions. And finally, decidability. Decidability is somewhat related to reliability, 
but is uh, different also in that respect that in case of reliability, we are measuring the precision of prediction, but for decidability, we are considering the decision which are based on the prediction. So how uh, good the decision uh, from the predictions. So th that we discuss in decidability as aspect. So we can uh, present this like uh, in this manner. Uh, the molecules with experimental response. So uh, we will have uh, the independent variable, X variables, and dependent variable, Y variable. So Y variable is the response or biological activity or toxicity that we are going to model. And using the independent X variables or molecular descriptors, we develop the QSR model. And uh, we can also design new molecules based on the developed model. And from the descriptor values of the new molecules, we can judge whether the developed QSR model is applicable or not. So it may be either inside activity domain based on the descriptor values of the new compounds or outside the domain. If it's outside the domain, then the prediction is not reliable. We cannot apply the model for prediction of these compounds. So then we have to change the structure so that the new structure again comes within the domain. Now, if it is inside domain, then we have to see whether the predict predictions are reliable or not. If it is outside reliability domain, then we have to uh, uh, search for the appropriate model for reliable prediction. But if it is reliable, then we will go for final decision, whether the decision with concluding remarks can be made or not. If it is, it can be made, then we can consider that the decidability of the model is good. So considering all three aspects, applicability, reliability, and decidability, we can discuss the confidence level or decision domain of a model developed. Now there are different uh, methods of uh, development uh, of, uh, of checking applicability domain. So there are range-based uh, uh, methods uh, range of descriptor values, which include the bounding box method, PCA, principal component analysis, bounding box method, top cat, optimal prediction space, then distance based method, including leverage, equilibrium distance, Molanovic distance, city block distance, portal uh, uh, square test, uh, KNN, DMODX, and uh, STD, ensemble predictions. Geometrical approach, uh, including convex hull calculations, probability density distribution method, including both parametric and non parametric, response variable based uh, method, uh, uh, which uses a uh, range of uh, response values, and finally, miscellaneous, uh, including standardization approach, stepwise approach, and various machine learning methods. So, I'll discuss some of these methods with some detail. So the first one is the bounding box uh, method. Bounding box method is actually the based on the uh, range of the descriptor values. Range of the descriptor values. So we have to consider the range of each of the uh, descriptor of the training set compounds, and uh, it is desirable that the value of the uh, particular descriptor for the query compound will, will be within that range. And accordingly, we can consider a uh, that is rectangle uh, within which uh, the training set molecules will be enclosed, and it is desirable that the test set compounds are, are also enclosed within that domain. So, as I said, this is based on the highest and lowest values of X variables, uh, descriptors of the QSL model, and Y variable that is response of the training set. So any test molecules which are outside this uh, particular ranges are considered out of the AD of that uh, and their predictions are less reliable. Next, I go to a principal uh, principal component uh, space. As we know that principal components are actually uh, uh, they, uh, that is uh, this is a method of uh, data reduction. So we may have uh, a, large area of uh, descriptors which can actually be reduced by using principal component analysis and the principal components are actually uh, orthogonal to each other and uh, they explain the maximum variance of the uh, descriptor matrix and uh, then if we uh, consider uh, the principal components 
of the uh, descriptive values of the training set compounds. Then based on the uh, ranges of the principal component score, we can uh, define a domain within which the test set compound should remain. For example, say here the compound still enclosed within the, the circle would be within the applicable domain of the model and the compounds which are outside the domain uh, that will be called outside the activity domain. So principal components transform the initial data into a new orthogonal coordinate system by the rotation of axis and facilitate to correct for correlation among descriptors. Newly formed axes are defined as species presenting the maximum variance of the total data set. And the points between the lowest and highest values of the scores by M dimensional hyper rectangle with sides parallel to the PCs. The third one is a the, the convex well, plot. This is a geometrical method. This is a polygon, convex shape polygon, considering the training set data. And it is desirable that the tested compounds will be enclosed within the domain of the training compounds. So this method estimates the direct coverage of n dimensional set utilizing the convex, convex R calculations performed based on complex but efficient algorithms. Uh, actually, with the increase of uh, the dimension, the complexity of calculation increases, so it is good for two to three dimension. The approach uh, recognizes the boundary of the data set considering the degree of data distribution. Interpolation space is suggested by the smallest axis aligned convex regions containing the inter set. Next is distance, distance to the centroid plot. Now, centroid uh, may be considered as a grand mean based on the descriptive values, and the distance from the centroid may be uh, a measure centroid for based on the training set data. And you can consider the distance of a particular test compound from the centroid. If it is outside the domain, outside it is too uh, too far, then it is outside domain. So here it is shown by this uh, the, the 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 ellipse uh, the outside the the ellipse uh, the compounds uh, are outside domain and inside the ellipse it's within the domain. So the ellipsoidal region is centered on the data set grand mean and has its principal axis based on the eigenvectors of the data set variance covariance matrix. The next method is Williams plot. It is actually based on leverage uh, approach. Uh, which is uh, calculated based on the hat matrix. So this, uh, this plot is actually called uh, the Insabria plot, where we, we have uh, uh, plotted leverage uh, against standardized uh, residuals. So x-axis is the leverage and y-axis is standardized residual. And the value of the, uh, the leverage for a particular compound should be within the, uh, within the threshold value in the x-axis and the, and the y-axis is the standard, standardized residual so this should be within the uh, three uh, standardized residual and uh, if it is not within the three standardized residual then it will be a prediction uh, outline. Now what is uh, the leverage? Leverage of a molecule in the variable space can be computed from hat matrix like this. Here capital X is uh, the X uh, matrix of the training set compound and the small x i, this is actually the vector, x vector of a particular compound i. The AD space uh, of the model is defined by the squared area within the plus minus three band for standardized residual and the leverage threshold is uh, three multiplied by p plus one by n, where p is the number of descriptors and is n is the number of molecules. So the leverage values are calculated for and plotted versus cross variety standardized residual labeled as Williams plot, also called Insabria plot, uh, like this. Next one is uh, Euclidean uh, distance plot. Here, based on the Euclidean distance and uh, normalized uh, values, using normalized uh, Euclidean distance values, we can uh, set a threshold uh, for the training set compounds, and if the tested compounds are within the that threshold, then that will be within the domain. If it is outside, then that will be called outside domain. Now, Euclidean distance can be calculated based on this expression. 
this is known to all. Uh, uh, so it calculates the distance of, uh, of a particular point from every other point in the data set. And it is calculated by this. And the mean distance of one sample to the residual ones can be calculated like this. So we need the mean distance. Uh, provided that we have to use uh, the, the standardized values uh, of the uh, equilibrium distance uh, measures. Next is k nearest neighbor food. This is based on th similarity principle. So uh, the new chemical entity, uh, its location in the space with respect to training set compounds is uh, detected. And this similarity is evaluated uh, by taking the distance of the query molecule from the nearest uh, training compound or its distances from k nearest neighbors in the training set. And we can set some threshold uh, below which it will be within the domain and above which it will be outside the domain. Next one is DMODX approach, the distance to model in the space. This is basically applied for the partial squares. Uh, method uh, in the in an approach uh, developed by old uh, et al. So here the X residuals and Y residuals are important for PLS modeling and the fu fundamental hypothesis uh, lies in the residuals of Y and X which are diagnostic values. As the number of X residual residuals uh, uh, may be high so we have to consider the standard deviation of X residuals. So the standard deviation uh, is proportional to the distance between the data point and the model plane in the X space. That's why it is called distance in model in the X space. And there will be some threshold value. The compound, the test compound should be within that threshold value. Next is Tanimoto coefficient is a measure of similarity. So we can measure similarity between two compounds uh, by measuring Tanimoto coefficients, uh, which compares the number of common molecular fragments between two compounds. So this is the expression by which all this can be calculated and the actually distance between two compounds, G and K will be one minus the animoto uh, coefficient between those two compounds. So obviously if the uh, level of similarity is higher, then the test compound uh, will be within the domain. If it is lower, then outside domain. Then another interesting approach is STD approach, which is based on ensemble predictions. So if we have a set of uh, QSL models and a particular test compound is predicted uh, based on uh, several models, so we'll get several predictions. So it is logical to think that one uh, uh, prediction may be wrong, but all predictions may not be wrong. So uh, we can compare the predictions from different models and then we can uh, compare the predicted values from different models and you see the corresponding the deviation among the predictions uh, from different models. Uh, if you see the deviations are too high, uh, the, it is varying too much from different models, then there is a possibility that the particular component is outside domain. That's why the models are unable to predict well. So we can calculate uh, that uh, deviation from uh, this expression and you can actually plot uh, if uh, uh, the uh, degree of uh, the deviation is small, then will be reliable prediction. If we have more uh, deviation, then that will be unreliable prediction. Then correlation of prediction vector. Here in this approach, actually we can correlate uh, vectors uh, of uh, ensemble predictions for the query molecule and compound from the training set. So similar to STD, that this calculation is actually based on the ensemble or prediction. So we can uh, uh, calculate the Corel value, uh, which is at one minus correlation between two vectors. And if the, the correlation between two vectors is high, actually high degree of similarity, this uh, decorel value will be low. So when the correlation value is high or decorel value is low, then the compound or test compound is within the domain. Next we come to Applicative domain using standardization approach. This is based on the concept of a normal distribution pattern. So if we consider the descriptor values of the training set compounds will be normally distributed. And if we also consider if we have the population of test comp query compounds, those uh, descriptor values also will be normally distributed. Then we can apply this method. And according to this, uh, 
hypothesis uh, of normal distribution when we have the mean plus minus three sigma that actually covered 99.7 percent of the data. So this is based on this concept. Actually, this has been developed by our laboratory. So according to this ideal distribution pattern, 99.7 percent of the population would stay within the range mean plus minus three standard deviation. And mean plus minus three standard deviation actually the zone where the majority majority of the training compound belong to. So any compound that is outside the domain that may be considered as outside the domain. So what is done? Uh, the, uh, initially, all the descriptive values are standardized. You know, standardization means uh, the uh, you have to take the uh, descriptor column for particular descriptor column, and each descriptor value for each compound is. Uh, uh, that is subtracted from the mean of that column and then you have to divide by the standard deviation that gives you the standardized value. And then you have to check whether this standardized value of, uh, of a particular descriptor for a particular compound, whether that is more than three or not. So if it is uh, more than three, then uh, from the concept of the previous one, you can see when it's uh, mean plus minus three sigma, if it is outside that domain, that means it is actually different from the most of the compounds in your population. So if it is outside mean plus minus three sigma, then you can uh, conclude that particular compound is actually dissimilar from the most of the compounds in your data set. So it is based on that concept. So first standardize uh, all descriptor values using this expression. You can see the descriptor value minus mean divided by standard deviation. Then one needs to calculate the maximum value uh, for a particular molecule K. And if the maximum value is uh, lower than or equal to three, then you can consider all other values, all other uh, standardized values are also less than three. So you are confident that all the compounds are within the domain. But if the maximum value is above three, then you have, we have to check also the minimum value uh, for that particular descriptor. If that is also above three, then Actually, all the values, uh, standardized values are more than point, more than three. Then you are confident that uh, that is a X outlier. But the problem arises when the maximum value is more than three and the minimum value is less than three. Then that means the sum of the descriptor values are actually the showing standardized value more than three, and some of the descriptor values are showing less than three. So then we actually apply the Z uh, distribution pattern, the relative frequency of occurrence according to Z distribution. And according to this, so we calculate this in S new value from the mean of SK and 1.28 uh, into the standard deviation of SK values. 1.28 corresponds to 90%. Uh, so uh, this is diagrammatically represented here. Uh, first, you have the input data and you standardize the variable. Then you calculate the maximum value, which is less than three, then is Compound is within domain is more than three, then also calculate the minimum one. If minimum is also more than three, then uh, uh, it is outside domain. But if it is less than three, then you go for this uh, S new calculation. And then if S new is more than three, then it's outside domain. If it's less than three, then it's within domain. So it is a very simple method. Uh, uh, it, uh, this can be calculated uh, using simple uh, Excel sheet. Uh, so actually no software is needed. Uh, and uh, its performance uh, has been seen similar to the leverage approach. So it is simple and computationally easy. There is no need of using any specialized statistical software. One needs only NS Excel to compute AD in this approach. But we have developed an open access uh, standalone application uh, in our laboratory. Actually, it has been developed by Dr. Provin Amure, uh, who was. Uh, with our group previously now is in in uh, in Spain with some company. So uh, this software can be accessed from the following link. This link this is a link and uh, this is the second link. So this can be freely downloadable. And this can be used for identification of outliers in the training compound. So if, uh, for the training set compounds, we uh, use the term outlier. For the test set compounds, we use the term outside activity domain. This approach complies with OECD principle three. And uh, uh, although this approach was introduced for MLR model, but actually it can be used for other, uh, other uh, uh, methods also. 
So this is the paper uh, where you will find the details uh, of this approach. Uh, this was published in Geometrics and Intelligent Laboratory System in 2015. And these are the websites uh, from where you can download the tool along with several other tools. OK, next I discuss the stepwise approach. This is discussed by Dimit uh, Dimitrov et al. So they discuss applicability domain in terms of general domain, structural domain, mechanistic domain, and uh, and uh, domain of metabolic stimulation. So general domain speaks about the physiochemical space and uh, physical space, property space of the query com compounds uh, in uh, relation to uh, the training set data. The structural domain actually deals with the structural similarity of the test set compound with the, with, with the training set compound. The mechanistic domain, uh, this model domain uh, merges reliability of specific functional groups as to cause the effect and planetary uh, variables. So here some aspect of me uh, mechanism of action is also considered, uh, especially with respect to the uh, uh, drugs, uh, pharmaceuticals. So the query compounds that we are predicting, whether they have that have similar mechanism of the training compound or not, that is also important uh, while considering or applying uh, a model for a particular response and the metabolic stimulation, the metabolism pattern, the how a particular component is metabolized because uh, the biological activity from a particular compound which we get is not due to the, in, the, the compound itself. It may be metabolized in the body. The metabolites uh, may have some different mechanism of action or it may be toxic. So we have to consider those aspects also in entirety of actively domain concept. So here I discuss some uh, software tools uh, for uh, calculation of active domain like uh, so that it uses uh, leverage approach. Uh, this QZRINS is developed by uh, University of Insabria, uh, Paula Grammaticas group. So there we'll get uh, this uh, uh, Williams plot. Then domain manager, uh, the, that is range and distance based approach, uh, University of Bulgaria. The applicability domain using standardized standardization approach that I've already, already discussed, Euclidean uh, applicability domain, and ADMDI, uh, the model disturbance index. These last three standardization approach, Euclidean do, uh, domain uh, distance based approach, and ADMDI index based approach. These three approach, these are available in this site. Uh, the applicability domain using these three approaches can be done using tools available in these sites. I'll uh, discuss a little bit about the ADMDI approach. That is model disturbance approach. Now, if a particular compound is uh, fit for a particular model, the inclusion of that uh, particular compound in that model will actually increase the uh, 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 prediction quality. But if it is uh, not uh, um, uh, fit for that particular model, inclusion of that compound will show poor prediction pattern. So this is based on this uh, concept. So the ADMDI uh, method differs from other methods which usually uses X information in the descriptor space or Y information in the property space individually. But this particular method uses both uh, X and Y information. It assumes that inclusion of a compound which is similar to the training compounds will generate lower disturbance. Uh, that is the measure of the two assess the difference of a model predictability between before and after the compound interaction of the model. So if we introduce the compound uh, to the model, then what happens? And if we uh, omit the, that particular compound, the model, model, then what happens? So high disturbance may result uh, for outlier compounds. Indeed, this assumption can easily be understood from the influence of QSL model by outliers, where a model is substantially improved if outlier is excluded, and because the outlier has significant influence on the data set. So this we experience uh, in many cases. Sometimes a particular compound shows very outlier behavior and show high prediction residual, but if we com this, that compound is uh, omitted from the model, then model quality improves. So this is based on that concept. And finally, the trad is approach, uh, the, 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 the whole concept of AD, uh, which uh, considers uh, various aspects uh, of uh, accurate domain, and it discusses about full-fledged decision domain. Uh, 
So Hansler proposed the TRADIS approach, which uh, considers transparency, applicability, reliability, decidability, and integrity, and support to capture these mentioned requirements. The prediction tools which maintain and follow TRADIS approach, TRADIS principle, offer experts means to understand the prediction and decision making steps. So these are different steps. Transparency of the method. I've already mentioned that this is already there in OECD principle two. The method should be transparent. Everything should be unambiguous. Then applicability, applicability, reliability, and decidability. This also I've already discussed uh, within decision domain. Then comes interpretability of the model hypothesis. How much uh, the model is interpretable? You have de developed the model. You have uh, predicted uh, the query compound using the developed model, and you have also calculated the applicability domain, uh, whether the query components are within domain or not. But it is also uh, important to understand that the model should be interpretable uh, in the physiochemical space. It should give some mechanistic interpretation, and it should support the conclusion with evidence. So that comes under decision support. So this uh, decision domain, region support, and transparent decision. Uh, all of these contribute to the TRADIS approach. The QSR model developers need to realize that single AD method uh, cannot be relied upon as the ideal one to recognize the interpolation region for any QSR model. As the background hypothesis of every AD study is different, actually one should consider the uh, diverse approach. So one should not consider the AD of a model using a single approach. One may, should consider multiple approaches of activity domain determination. Widespread research is being carried out on new approaches and amendment of already accessible approaches to make them more acceptable and decision or the designs. So how we can think for the future with respect to applicable domain? Uh, we should consider the global similarity test. Uh, uh, usually we consider only uh, the training set descriptors uh, uh, to define applicable domain of a model, but we can also consider the global similarity, uh, considering the other descriptors also uh, to determine the applicability of a particular model for a particular query compound. The like, regulatory agencies and QSR experts should maintain a conceptual framework for the assessment of AD maintaining the OECD guidelines. Acceptable uh, confidence limits for various AD approaches need to be defined. And to make the concept of AD estimation more user friendly using uh, uh, using the open access software tools. QSR users must possess the AD concept and its implementation in the QSR models. And no model should be accepted without proper evidence of the study. So nowadays we have different uh, software tools which enable us to develop different models. One can calculate different descriptors, one can apply different statistical tool to develop the model, but one should also be able to calculate the applicability domain, whether the, the developed model is, uh, uh, is able to predict uh, the new query compounds uh, or not. The hypothesis and assessment criteria of the newly developed AD approaches should be transparent. Now comes uh, that how the reliability of predictions is related to applicability domain. As I told that uh, within the domain, there may be several compounds and actually for some of the approach, there may be some uh, vacant regions also. I have shown some say, bounding box approach. Uh, the bounding box uh, is the rectangular uh, space within which uh, the points are enclosed, but uh, it doesn't tell anything about uh, how uh, densely they are packed. In some regions, they are densely packed and in some regions they are loosely packed. So, uh, so in some region, you will find the training compounds uh, with uh, more representation. So if your uh, test compounds are located in that region, so that can be predicted uh, with high degree of confidence. Rather, if you th your compound, test compound is in a domain that's within the applicability domain, but uh, in that region, the number of training set compounds are limited. In that case, uh, the reliability will not be good, although uh, this is within the domain. So applicability domain is not the final thing. So it, it just gives a gross uh, uh, idea whether the model will be applicable or not. But you should have some other measure to know whether the predictions that you are getting from your model are reliable or not. So we'll discuss 
uh, about the reliability of prediction in our second part of the talk. How precise our QSR derived predictions for new query compounds? <clears throat> Actually, here our objective was to formulate a set of rules or criteria to define reliability of prediction from the QSR models for new query compounds. So uh, here the quality of predictions we can grossly uh, classify into three parts, good, moderate, or bad or unreliable. Now previously also several work, uh, several studies were conducted uh, based on uh, the number of neighbors in the training data set, average Euclidean distance to the training data set, local sensitivity of a re regulation model, leave one out cross validation of nearest neighbor, bagging approach, property based similarity uh, index using bootstrapping and so on. So here what we wanted to do, we use a simple method, simple concept to know the reliability of predictions. We have uh, developed uh, this model mainly for the multiple linear regression uh, uh, based models. So we start with the read, uh, reading uh, input data of the training and test set compounds. So reading data means that uh, reading descriptor values of the training and test compounds and uh, the corresponding uh, uh, response values. So according to rule one or criterion one, what we do, we uh, consider uh, scoring uh, based on the mean absolute residue error, that is a leave one out based mean absolute error of the closest 10 training compounds. That means for each query compounds, we have to identify 10 closest training compounds. So while identified team closes training compound, it may so happen that uh, 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 some compounds are actually at much a distant place from, from a particular uh, test or query compounds, or there is not sufficient number of close the training support ever available. So that we have to define. Uh, so how close, what is the, uh, the maximum allowed distance that we uh, permit? Uh, so we can apply different threshold or criteria. We are not going into that details, but what we are doing, we are identifying 10 closest training compounds uh, for a particular query compounds, and then we try to see what is the uh, performance of that particular model for those 10 uh, closest compounds in terms of leave one out uh, error, mean absolute error. And if the mean uh, absolute error, leave one out, is uh, low, then, then we can uh, say that uh, that particular model actually works well for those uh, uh, closest 10 compounds. And uh, we can give some weightage based on these values. According to criteria two, uh, which is actually aptly domain based criteria, I've already discussed aptly domain and we have also discussed different methods, but we apply here the method based on the standardization approach that we have already discussed. And we see whether the query compounds are within the domain or not based on this standardization approach. And then we uh, give some score. <coughs> and then according to criteria three, uh, we score, uh, uh, we give uh, some score based on the proximity of a particular query compound to the observed the response mean on the training set compounds. Because it has been seen if uh, the training set, if the, if the query compound uh, response is close to the training set mean, then it uh, the model performs well. Or in other words, the performance of a model will be better for data points which are close to the training set. Mean. So based on this concept, we uh, use uh, this weighting, we, we scoring, and then we get three scores, and we will have some weighting system: weight one, weight two, weight three, and then we get some composite score. And this composite score, if it is three, then we'll consider this a good prediction. If it is two, then it's a moderate prediction. If it is one, then it's poor or unreliable prediction. Now we'll see how we actually do this scoring. Now, according to the criterion one, the scoring based on quality of leave one out predictions of closest 10 training compounds to a test or external compound. As I already mentioned that 10 training set compounds are identified that are most uh, similar to a particular test or query compounds. And we have to calculate mean absolute error based on leave one out uh, for those uh, closest 10 com compounds. And the scoring is done based on this. How if uh, the mean absolute error of leave one out 
is less than equal to 10% of the training set range and mean absolute error leave one out plus three times of standard deviation uh, that actually covers 99.7% data is less than 20% of the training set range then we give a score three that is the highest score based on this if the mean absolute error leave one out more than 15% uh, of the training set range or if the mean absolute error of leave one out plus three times standard deviation is more than 25% of the training set range, then we'll give score one because it's a bad prediction. And uh, in between these uh, moderate prediction, that score two predictions which do not fall in uh, under either of the above conditions. So in this way, we give scores three, two, and one according to the first criteria. And the, the, the background uh, information is given in this particular paper published in Geometrics and Intelligent uh, Laboratory System in 2016. Then the criterion two based on applicability domain, this I've already discussed where we compute uh, the descriptor, uh, uh, standardized values of descriptors, and then we calculate the maximum SI value. If it is less than three, then we get score three. If it is not uh, more than three, then we have to ca calculate the minimum value. If minimum is also uh, minimum is more than three, then there's a bad actually we outside domain. So we get score one. If it is not that, then we have to calculate this new value. And if the new value is uh, more than three, then we get score one, but uh, that is outside domain. And if it is less than three, then you get two. Uh, that is not as much good as, as score three here but in between, so it gets score two here. So this is based on this paper in Geometrics and Intelligent Laboratory System, where you get the background information. And then criterion three, as I was discussing, that uh, if your compound is uh, in with the range of plus minus uh, uh, the two standard deviation of, uh, from the training set pin, then we give the maximum score. And uh, if it is uh, uh, in the range of uh, between two to three sigma, then we give score two. And if it is beyond uh, more than three sigma, then we get the bet actually score one. Based on this particular paper in Geometrics and Intelligent Liberty System published in 2017. So now we have composite score and uh, we will give weightage uh, to each of these scores. W1, W2, W3. And this W1, W2, W3, that can be uh, actually set in an automated way, uh, starting from uh, some particular values, and then you can increase that uh, value in different iterations. So one can do that. So what we did, we used five different data sets. Five different data sets. Um, some pharmaceutical data sets and uh, some solvent data sets and uh, also some data sets of uh, uh, toxicity related to toxicity. So what you did? So we have five data sets. In each case, we divided the data set into training and test uh, in three different, three different ways, sorted response, kinase stone, and modified chemidoids. And uh, in each case, so we divided the using 70 to 30 ratio, 70% compound goal to the training set and 30% compound in the test set. And then we uh, develop model using criteria stepwise uh, MLR and the genetic function MLR and partial least squares. And all the developed models were validated using internal metrics such as uh, the Q score LO, MAE training, and external metrics like Q score F1, MAE test. And based on the absolute uh, prediction error, then we have classified. So actually, this absolute prediction error that uh, actually can be used as a reference that is actual difference between the observed and predicted values. If for the test set compound, the actual prediction error is less than 15% of the training set range, then good prediction. If it is more than 25% of the training set range, then it's bad prediction, so get score one. And if it is uh, more than 15% of the training set range, but less than 25%, then we we'll give score two. So this percent correct prediction uh, is compared uh, 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 with the scores uh, derived from the absolute uh, residual error. 
and the composite score obtained by giving different weights to, to the individual scores that we have previously done. So I told you the, that uh, there are three different uh, uh, criteria, criteria one, criteria two, criteria three, based on which uh, we give some composite score. And that composite score is compared to this uh, reference score that we obtain from the prediction error. And we have used also four additional data sets, each containing training, test, and two external set. For each model, at first the weighted recombination uh, was selected based on the optimal uh, percent, correct percent value. And this uh, percent correct value for the external set were, then, were computed using the selected weighted combination from the test set data. Uh, then we tried to analyze uh, the cases where we see the difference between uh, the scores that we get from the the, 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 the composite uh, scoring system from three different scores with different weightage and the score from the prediction error and where the difference is higher. Whether the such test and true uh, external compounds are outside the applicability domain, whether the observed responses are close to the training set mean or distant from that in different levels whether the minimum equilibrium distance between the test compound and the closest uh, member of the training set compound is too high, and the generalized jacquard uh, uh, similarity coefficients. So we try to explore when the, there is a much difference between the two approaches, from approach from the prediction error and approach from the uh, composite score. Uh, in case uh, it is outside applicable domain, in case it is away from the training set compounds, in case it are from the training set response beam. So always we get some prediction from our tool, from some of the tool, but it is always uh, important to know whether the prediction that we are getting are reliable or not. So the, a tool that tells us that the prediction is reliable or not is actually important. So this is the uh, graphical user interface for the tool that we have developed, uh, that is prediction reliability indicator that gives you uh, the information about the uh, quality of prediction for a multiple linear regression uh, derived prediction. And as I was mentioning, we have used uh, five different data saves uh, in three different way of uh, division. Uh, so we got different models. And so we analyzed uh, uh, our results obtained from two different approaches, one from reference approach, another is composite score based approach. And then we tried to find uh, using which weighting scheme criteria we get the best results. And actually we found in the 80% of cases, if we use a weighted scheme 0 0.5, 0 0.5, we get the uh, uh, good concordance between the two schemes. And this is the radar diagram for uh, the different data sets. Uh, and this is uh, from the for the composite results, uh, for combined results. And we see the 0 0.5, 0 0.5 gives you the best uh, uh, combination of weightage. The real challenge of a QSR model is to estimate the reliability of prediction when the model is applied to completely new set of data, even when the new data points are within applicability domain. So some points may be within the applicability domain, but we do not really know what is the reliability of prediction because for all compounds, the model does not predict to the same level of confidence. So in this study, we have classified the quality of predictions for the test or external compounds into three groups, good, moderate, and bad. And then we have used three criteria as suggested earlier in different weighted scheme for making a composite score of prediction. We have seen that the weighting scheme 0 0.5, 0 0.5, uh, if we use this scheme, the composite score based categorization showed concordance with the absolute prediction error based categorization. Absolute prediction error based categorization is may, may be considered as a reference uh, for more than 80% test data while working with five different data sets. Uh, with 15, uh, 15 model for each uh, set derived using three different splitting techniques. So these observations were also confirmed with four two external. So I told uh, we have used four external sets also. So for those cases also we got similar results. So uh, we conclude from the retrospective analysis of the results that when the equilibrium distance is high, uh, uh, in that case uh, actually the uh, reliability of prediction is low equilibrium distance of a query compound from the training set data. The Jacquard says uh, coefficient between a test compound and its closest congener uh, congener in the training set is lower. 
and the, the training set's uh, response value is higher from the training set mean. When it's higher from mean, then also reliability operation is low. So the study, the data sets actually in the present study show uh, that the 0 0.5, 0 0.5 scheme actually is good uh, combination uh, for uh, most of the data sets. For almost 80% of the model, we got the optimum weighting scheme 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Now, what is 0 0.5? The first 0 0.5 is based on the MA LO of the uh, closest 10 compounds. The zero is based on applicable domain, and 0 0.5 is based on the last one, the, the resistance from the training set response beam. So actually, here we are give, giving here the zero weightage to applicable domain. Although applicable domain is important, but we are we are getting zero weightage. Why? Because in the first criteria, this 0 0.5, the behavior of the closest train, 10 training compounds in terms of MAELO, that has captured some information of applicable domain. So some information is already included here. So that's why you are uh, not getting any weightage of AD weighting. So, so this doesn't mean that AD is not important. AD is important, but that gives a gross idea about uh, whether the model is applicable or not. But to know the reliability of prediction, you should have some other tool to know the say confidence of prediction or, or the uncertainty of prediction or reliability of prediction. The first criterion of LO based MA uh, criteria for, for based on 10 close the training compounds capture the behavior of similar train training compounds. Therefore, it appears that is not only the closeness or similarity that is important, but behavior of the similar compounds for being predicted by a model is important. And this actually varies uh, from uh, different clusters of compounds due to fixed composition of the model. So whether, although you have a, a large number of compounds within the applicable domain, so you have different clusters within the applicable domain. So you should identify whether uh, the di uh, different clusters actually are behaving in the similar manner or different manner. And whether your test compounds belong to which cluster, is it close to which cluster. So based on that, the reliability of prediction will vary. We can conclude that the AD can grossly show the reliability of prediction, but the criteria proposed here can reflect both reliability and prediction quality. So the details of this SOAR can be found uh, from this uh, open access uh, uh, paper published in ACS Omega in 2018. So one can go through this for further details. Thank you very much. I'll uh, like to take two or three questions based on uh, the uh, theme of today's uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so thank much, you so uh, much sir. Uh, sir. It's a yeah. really very wonderful session. And uh, I'd like to inform you that uh, we had some technical issues in YouTube uh, okay. due to which uh, we are not able to fetch the questions. So okay. uh, what we we'll do is uh, once we get all the questions, so we can take them uh, maybe in another question answer session, which is uh, supposed to be scheduled next Saturday, maybe. Okay. So uh, for this session, so we'll not take any question and uh, we'll see so how we can sort it out. Uh, okay. Sorry for this uh, inconvenience, but it was a technical okay. issue from the YouTube itself. Okay. So thank you so much sir, for your uh, wonderful session. And uh, on behalf of the DDS team, we'd again like to thank you for giving us the time and uh, such information for this uh, training program. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much.